This is VLX number 120, The Rich Young Man. We are in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. VLX stands for Video Lexu Divina, the Patristic Bible Study and Ignatian Prayer Series online. God give you his peace in nomine patri sefidi et spiritu sancti. Amen. God our Lord, we ask the grace that all of our intentions, actions, and operations be directed purely to the service and praise of your divine majesty. In nomine patri sefidi et spiritu sancti. Amen. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. Okay, I have some important announcements after this podcast. Nothing too big on my life, just things that are going to help you probably meditate a little bit. But let's briefly review what brought us here to Matthew 19. You know, Matthew 19, it's all about vocation and preparation for heaven. That's literally what Matthew 19 is entirely about, vocation and preparation for heaven. So we first learned that Christ allowed no divorce. That was the beginning of Matthew 19. Christ allows no divorce. And we saw from the Holy Fathers that there was probably no annulments in the first thousand years of Catholicism. No annulments in the first thousand years of Christianity. And then, a little bit later in Matthew 19, we learned about these eunuchs for the kingdom. That is Christ's call to celibacy to some people on earth, but it is the angelic life for all those who are saved in that state in heaven, even as we get our bodies back. Then we saw in Matthew 19, the little children come to Christ. Of course, children come from marriage. But we saw that they have a strength and a sincerity of the celibates of old. And then we have today's section which ties poverty to celibacy. Keep that on the back burner as we go through today, that poverty is tied to celibacy. It's often forgotten that apostolic poverty is tied to celibacy so that we can cling entirely to God for him and so that he can use us in any way because we have no attachments to family. Of course, family requires money, so as we will see, celibacy is very linked to following Jesus closely in poverty. But both have to do with total freedom, not sadness or living in filth or having it all come out sideways in some form of perversion. The whole point is freedom in following Christ. It's a very free life that Christ is going to propose to this young man, this rich young man, in Matthew 19. So let's look at verses 16 and 17. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Now actually, we're going to see a similar account or a similar situation in both Mark 10 and Luke 18 of this rich young man coming up to Jesus. And there's going to be a very important line in Mark 10 that is not found in Matthew 19 today. And we're going to look at that. But imagine this princely young man come up to Christ amidst all these crowds following Jesus. And I think you're going to see this young man, this rich young man, he does have an ego. He's looking for a compliment since he kept the commandments. He's looking for a compliment for his ego for keeping the commandments. But he's also genuinely seeking something more fulfilling in the spiritual life than just being a good Jew who keeps the basic commandments. St. John Chrysostom says that this rich young man came with a pure heart and sincere intention of asking how he could become like a little child according to Christ's precept and thus become a partaker of the everlasting life which Christ just promised to the little ones and to those who are like them. 
So notice that that last section on children is connected here. That's one of the amazing things as I go through this VLX series to see that these are not disconnected. This rich young man probably watched this whole interaction with children. And so St. John Chrysostom, he connects that in the quote that you just heard me bring you. Okay, so the young man calls Jesus good. And then when Jesus says to him, why do you ask me about what is good? You know, there's a gentleness, not a nastiness. Not that anything that our Lord says is nasty, but there's a real, there's a real gentleness that comes out in the Greek right there. It's time erotas peritu agathu. Why do you ask me about the good? So agathu is the genitive of where we get that saint named Agatha, literally the feminine for saint, good. And I picture in Matthew 19 here, I picture Jesus looking down, but speaking straight into the heart of that rich young man. Time rotas peritu agathu. Why do you ask me about the good? Why do you ask me about the good? And I believe Jesus kept such great custody of the eyes, even as he looked and spoke right into the souls of others. And then Jesus says to him, Heis esten ho agathos. Literally one, or heis. One there is who is good. And then there's agathos again. But that word one in Greek, there's a few different words for one in Greek, but here it's heis. Well, who is that one? Of course, it's only God alone. So obviously Jesus in some sense is being either playful or ironic or mystical in saying that, that there's only one who's good because, because of course Christ is God. Why is God so good? Father Lapide has some great words. He says, In God there is infinite perfection, both of nature and wisdom, of power, holiness, and virtue. There is therefore in him the highest goodness, natural, moral, and supernatural. That is why he is the fountain of all good, in whom all the excellencies of all creatures are gathered together and infinitely better than they are in the creatures. Therefore, in God, there is in an eminent degree the beauty of gold, the splendor of jewels, the savor of delicacies, the harmony of music, the pleasantness of gardens, and whatsoever there is lovely, pleasant, and delicious in creatures. Hence it is from God that honey derives its sweetness, the sun its radiance, the stars their light, the heavens their glory, angels their knowledge, men their virtue, animals their sensations, plants their life, and all other things whatsoever they have of good, yes, it is to the bounty of God that they as mendicants or beggars owe their entire being and existence as a drop out of the ocean. In God, therefore, is all good, and that in a perfect and infinite degree. In God is the allurement of all love, the consummation of all desire, the satisfying of all appetite. Why then, O wretched man, do you wander about among these poor created goods, and with all these are not satisfied. Seek good in him, in whom is all good. Okay, and then back to the text. Jesus then says, If you would enter life, keep the commandments. So the Greek here is literally, If you want in the life, enter into, keep the commandments. So notice here that Jesus is talking about eternal life. He's talking about heaven versus hell. So this should show how evil are those heretics, modern heretics today like James Martin, who are telling people they don't have to keep the commandments to enter into eternal life. And by him, I include everyone in his chain of command all the way to the top. You see, to speak against Christ's own teaching is following the spirit of the Antichrist, especially to single out one group of people to lead to hell, the very group James Martin claims to love. Nothing could be more evil to such people struggling with that temptation. And then today's section also disproves this modern Protestant idea of once saved, always saved, and faith alone. How do we know that? Because we have someone asking, Jesus Christ himself, how do I be saved? That is the big question today. How can I be saved? And notice that Christ's first answer is not, accept me as Lord and Savior. That's actually important. We're going to see a lot of that in St. Paul when we get there. Um, but his answers keep the commandments. This is Jesus' own answer himself on the very first thing you have to do to be saved. He doesn't say have good thoughts and emotions about me, but keep the commandments. Isn't that amazing? Everyone is asking these days, how are Christians saved? Jesus gives his own answer here, which is keep the commandments. And that's why it's, again, so evil when there's Catholics out there saying you don't have to keep the commandments, 
or the faith alone idea of Martin Luther. It's totally disproved in today's section. Keep the commandments. Okay, which ones, the young man wants to know. And Jesus amazingly names these commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so in other words, if you don't keep these, any attempt to follow me, be that in mental prayer or with your own heart or in your affections, it's totally worthless. Because we haven't even gotten to the section yet today where Jesus is going to talk about following him closely. Now, it is true, mental prayer will really help you keep the commandments because Jesus does say, he does say elsewhere, if you love me, you will keep the commandments. Um, but today, the chronology before we get to following him closely, Jesus' first answer to be saved is to keep the commandments. And so notice, these are the prereqs to following Christ closely, not the gravy to it. Father Lapide writes, Christ here teaches that it is not faith alone that justifies and saves, but good works are also required, by which is fulfilling the law, we may obtain the reward of eternal life and glory. Okay, and then let's talk a little bit about what we have in the commandments there. I am amazed, me personally here, I really am amazed that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And that Greek for that last part of Matthew 19, 19, and I think all you know when I say 19, 19, I mean chapter 19, verse 19. The Greek there is agapeses ton plesion su hos seauton. Okay, so agapeses, that is the imperative to love. So you will love, you should love. You might recognize the word agape in there. And then the direct object there is ton plesion su, which is your neighbor. And then we have almost the same word for as in English as as in Greek, which is hos, as Christ says, hos seauton. Hos seauton is as oneself or as yourself. Okay, so look at that. Agape here is linked to seyautan, meaning meaning you can't hate yourself. And I know there's times in my life when I've come to think traditional Catholicism means you have to hate yourself, but right there we see you have to stop hating yourself if you're going to love your neighbor. If you're going to enter into heaven, you actually have to stop hating yourself. And keeping the commandments is one of the best ways to love, your, to love yourself. Um, why is that? Because God is keeping nothing from us in his law. The law is made to make us happy on earth and in heaven. Yeah, we do have to carry our cross on earth. But as I've said before, I really am convinced those not carrying their cross on earth, even before we talk about heaven and hell, those not carrying their cross on earth are going to be more miserable. Okay, so in the same event here, St. Mark tells us something fascinating. He says, uh, he shows us something Jesus did to the young man that St. Matthew doesn't tell us. That doesn't mean St. Matthew failed in, in, in inerrancy here. It just means um, St. Mark includes something St. Matthew didn't. But both sec segments are the inerrant word of God. 1021 reads, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Okay, did you catch that? Before Jesus tells him to sell everything, we read that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Wow, right there, that could be your entire mental prayer for today. Imagine Jesus before any challenge he gives you on the moral life or following him closely, he looks at you in the eyes and he loves you. This isn't me making up fluffy spirituality. We've talked about how scripture is even higher than St. Thomas Aquinas as far as inerrancy, as far as what the magisterium teaches. This is the word of God. Every word exactly inspired by God. So this isn't me giving you fluffy spirituality. And what does it say before this young man gets this big challenge in Mark 10? And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. You know, the Latin there in Mark 10, 21, it's even more amazing. Jesus autum intuitus eum, dilexit eum. Jesus intuited inside him and dilexit eum, loved him. Dilexit, that's the same word we see on the paintings of the Sacred Heart. This heart which has so loved the world 
love there being delexit. So even though this rich young man, he is looking for a compliment for his ego, and even though Jesus is going to drop on him a much bigger challenge than he really expects, namely that he's going to have to sell all of his belongings if he wants to follow Christ on the road, on the way, Christ first looks at him and loves him. Jesus intuitus eum, dilexit eum. Okay, now back to Matthew 19, and we will rewind a verse from Mark, since that young man there, he shows he has kept all those commandments, as he answers in verse 20. He says, All these I have kept, what still do I lack? So remember all the commandments that Jesus just said. He honestly says, I don't think he's lying. He actually has kept all of these from his youth. That's pretty amazing. But he wants to know what he still lacks. And then verse 21, we hear Jesus' answer, how to follow him perfectly after keeping all the commandments. Jesus says to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Most of my listeners out there are lay people. Today's section might sadden you a little bit, hearing that to follow Christ closely, you do have to sell all your things. But we also have to look at how the church has interpreted this. And thankfully for you lay people, we see that a heretic, namely Pelagius, you probably know the term Pelagianism, we read in Father Lapide here on page 253, citing this, this term, go sell what you have, citing this, the Pelagians taught that no rich man can be saved unless he sell off his property and give to the poor and become poor himself. However, this is good news for most of you here. St. Augustine writes against this view, teaching that this is a counsel, not a precept. So keep in mind that counsel is a suggestion and precept is a commandment. So what St. Augustine here is saying is that this is one of the many things Pelagius was wrong about. Pelagius was saying that no rich people can go to heaven. Uh, and St. Augustine is saying that is wrong. However, clearly to follow Christ perfectly, you have to have this apostolic poverty, and we could probably make the argument apostolic celibacy too. Now this line, give to the poor, Father Lapide points out that Christ does not say, give this to your family or rich friends. Father Lapide says, for this is an act of natural and familial love. That is, if you were to just give all your stuff away to your family, he says, this is an act of natural love by which you do not cast away your riches, but deliver them to those who belong to you to be kept. Therefore, in this way, you do not leave the world, but rather immerse yourself further in it. But Christ says, give to the poor. Why? Because it is to them that you expect nothing in return. And you will have treasure in heaven. Father Lapide says, by the word treasure, St. Chris, John Christensen means the abundance and the permanence of the recompense as shown. And St. Hilary says, by the casting away of earthly possessions, heavenly wealth is purchased. And then Jesus says, come follow me. What does Father Lapide and the Father say there? Well, he quotes St. Jerome. St. Jerome says, for many, even when they leave their riches, do not follow the Lord. Neither does this suffice for perfection, unless after despising riches, they follow the Savior. That is, leave evil and do good. For the world is more easily renounced than the will. And so the words follow, come and follow me. So basically what St. Jerome is saying here is you can't just go sell your goods. There's people in different world religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, who can live in poverty, but that doesn't mean they're actually following Christ. You can sell all your things and not follow him. Christ's invitation to this rich young man is first keep the commandments, which he has succeeded at, and then sell everything, and then come and follow him. Father Lapide says, follow me implores the union of an active with a contemplative life. There is a threefold sort of holy life. The first and lowest is the active life. The second is the contemplative. The third and most perfect is the union of action with contemplation, so that what we derive from God by contemplation, we should afterwards teach to others. This was the life Christ and his apostles led. And so we have these three, poverty, chastity, and obedience, all found in Matthew 19, Lapide points that out too. He says, Christ sets forth the three chief evangelical counsels, namely of celibacy and continence in verse 12, of poverty when he says, sell what you have and give to the poor in verse 21, and of obedience when he says, follow me, that is, obey me in my commandments, adapt, imitate my obedience even unto death. 
I knew a Franciscan who described the three knots in his cord as no money, no honey, one boss. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. No money, no honey, one boss. And speaking of the Franciscans, let's look at St. Francis of Assisi. Of course, as you know, St. Francis of Assisi was that rich young man who sold everything to follow Christ. And so Father Lapide rightly looks to him as he says, St. Francis, that devotee of the Trinity, opened the gospel book three times, asking God three times for testimony that would confirm his friend Bernard's proposal. The first time the book was opened, he found that verse, If you will be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor. The second time he opened it, he reads, Take nothing for the way. And the third time he opened the gospel, he reads, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This, said the holy man, is our life and our rule, and that of all who want to be joined to our society. Go therefore, if you will be perfect and do what you have heard. St. Bernard says, These are the words which in all the world have persuaded men to a contempt of the world and to voluntary poverty. They are the words which fill the cloisters with monks, the deserts with anchorites. These, I say, are the words which despoil Egypt and strip it out and strip it of the best of its goods. This is the living and efficacious word converting souls by the happy emulation of sanctity and the faithful promise of truth. For Simon Peter said to Jesus, Behold, we have left all things. Then we have another addition from St. Bonaventure regarding St. Francis, pointing out that when asked by his disciples what virtue would most commend us to Christ our Lord and make us pleasing to him, St. Francis replied with unusual emotion, poverty, for it is the way of salvation, the fount of humility, the root of perfection, and from it there spring many fruits, although they be hidden and known to but few. For it puts an end to mine and thine, from whence all the strifes and wars arise among neighbors, says St. John Chrysostom. The same averts the mind from all care and love of earthly things and fixes it wholly upon God. And just one last thing on St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, I've read several books on his life, and one of my favorites is St. or rather G.K. Chesterton's book on St. Francis of Assisi. And when G.K. Chesterton wrote that about 100 years ago, he was already having to tackle this idea that St. Francis of Assisi was this proto-communist or a proto-socialist. And Chesterton does a really great job at disproving this by showing that anybody that followed Francis following Christ did in fact have to give everything up, but he didn't expect that of lay people across the countryside. He didn't expect the people who supported him, who he was working miracles for, who he was preaching the gospel to, certainly he wanted them to be generous with their material goods to all the poor that they met, but he didn't expect everyone. And so that's the main difference between socialism slash communism and the Franciscan way is St. Francis understood he had a special calling. So did his men and then eventually the women under St. Clair to live extreme poverty, but he had no intention on forcing that on everybody else. And so even 100 years ago, Chesterton had to disprove this idea that Francis of Assisi was this socialist hippie. It's just not true. So if you love St. Francis of Assisi as much as me, but you want some of these myths to be disproved, go read G.K. Chesterton's book, St. Francis of Assisi. And that's it for today. A few announcements for you. Least importantly, you can follow me on Telegram. I'm trying to be less and less on Facebook and Twitter, but you can follow me on Telegram. It's a free app, and you just have to search Padre Peregrino. I'll put a link in the show notes. One admonition or encouragement I have for you if you're doing the VLX series and not just listening, if you're actually um, trying to delve deep into this whole thing, one thing that will help you, especially if you're doing the apophatic way, is to memorize one line from every day that we look at. I know many people think it's a Protestant, not a Catholic thing to memorize the Bible, but you would be shocked how many desert fathers, how many great Catholic saints had the entire New Testament, and some of them even the Old Testament memorized. St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Anthony of Padua. So I think the least we can do to follow at a distance with them is to memorize maybe one verse of the Bible every single week, maybe one every day if you can do that. I also want to give you a couple quotes that we've gone over before on the importance of mental prayer. I'm really excited so many of you guys are tuning in, but remember this isn't about me. This is really about knowing Christ and being saved. St. Alphonsus Liguori says, It is morally impossible for him who neglects meditation to live without sin. 
St. Alphonsus, it's morally impossible for him who neglects meditation to live without sin. And then St. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa corroborates the statement in these words. She says, He who neglects mental prayer need not a devil to carry him to hell, but he brings himself there with his own hands. She also says, in a more encouraging way, the devil knows that he has lost the soul that perseveringly practices mental prayer. Isn't that amazing? That's why we do this series. St. Teresa of Avila, the devil knows that he has lost the soul that perseveringly practices mental prayer. Um, you know, I'm not going to see that new Padre Pio movie. I'm not going to get into why I don't think it's going to be so great. But I do believe Shia LaBeouf's conversion is genuine. And so we should pray for his perseverance. Recently, recently in an interview, he said something that I want to share with you listening to this VLX series because it really does tie into the two quotes you just heard. He said, I had never known how to pray because I could never cultivate silence. Isn't that amazing? I think he just hit it right on the head. He said, I had never known how to pray because I could never cultivate silence. So silence is really the backdrop. It's really the necessity of good mental prayer. Okay, these are all a little bit disjointed on these announcements. Um, I do have a blog post coming out. He who is not against us is for us. It's coming out tomorrow on my blog, padreperegrino.org. You can see that in the closing bumpers on YouTube. And in this blog post, I'm going to explain to you why it does not believe, it does not mean I believe in ecumenism when I quote a non-Catholic. So don't worry, I'm in no danger of leaving traditional Catholicism if you hear me quote a non-Catholic or a soon-to-be Catholic like Sheila Buff. When I quote someone who's not Catholic, making a good point, who I look to for the example of this is the Apostle Paul himself. I have pointed out before that in Acts 17.23, he quotes a pagan poet. It's just to make a point. It doesn't mean that he believes this pagan poet has the same beliefs as him. He just uses it to make a point. And finally, the last thing I want to do is read to you an email I got from one of these VLX listeners it was her meditation. We're going to call her BC. That was her initials. That is her initials, rather. And she had a meditation to share with me on VLX 53. That was on Christ calling St. Matthew, kind of linked to today. And so I was so um, honored and edified by this that I asked her if I could share it with you all. What I'm going to read you is really the fruit of someone delving deep into mental prayer. Not that everyone has to sound exactly like what I read you, but it really is a good example of how deep you can go as you go into Ignatian mental prayer. We were sitting in the tax collector's office. It was a typical day. The people were lined up to pay what they couldn't afford, desperation on the faces of some, resignation on others. We oftentimes fudged the records to indicate they owed more than they really did so we could skim some for ourselves. We had families to support, parents who depended on us, hungry children. That's at least how we rationalized stealing from our own neighbors. Matthew and I were talking, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man approach. I didn't recognize him. He wasn't from our village. But I saw Peter, James, and John behind him. I knew them. We grew up together. But when I became a tax collector, our friendship stopped. I understood I was stealing from them. I was an outcast, and I understood why. I had chosen my path. When Matthew caught sight of this stranger, he abruptly went silent. The two looked at each other. It was just a moment, but it seemed like all time stopped. The look on this man's face was something I can't explain. His whole countenance was indescribable. He looked at Matthew with such kindness and familiarity, and yet I was sure Matthew didn't know him. I was confused, bewildered, and curious. But what happened next astounded me. This man spoke just two words, follow me, and Matthew got up, walked out of the tax office, and followed him. A complete stranger. What is happening? Who is this that Matthew would risk his income and even his life if the Romans find out he just abandoned his post? Is it possible he is the one we have been hearing about that is performing great miracles? Everyone has been talking about him. Is this him? Later that evening I found out the answers to my questions and much, much more. Yes, he is that man. His name is Jesus. Here we are gathered around a table, dining with this miracle man. I looked around. We were all the worst of the village. Tax collectors, thieves, prostitutes. What a bunch. But everyone is laughing and talking and happy because of him. For the first time since I was a very young child, I felt accepted, welcomed, and loved. Yes, I felt loved. How long it had been since I felt 
normal? Something inside me told me I had to stay near this man. The feeling was so compelling I did not want to be out of his sight. I felt good and safe and loved in his presence. I was afraid if I didn't stay close to him I would drift back into my own life. Somehow I knew my only chance was to stick by him. I don't know how I knew this, but I was as certain as the sun rises and sets that I couldn't leave him or I would go back to my old ways. What happened next confirmed all my thoughts. There were whispers around the table that the Pharisees were outside grumbling about this teacher dining with the likes of us, and for a second I saw us as we had been ugly sinners. I was ashamed, but his reply set everything right again. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Then he said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I couldn't believe my ears. He was putting these learned men in their place. They think they have nothing to learn, and yet this teacher was schooling them. I could tell by their reaction they were deeply offended. But I had heard his words, I desire mercy, and I understood. Mercy was being poured out on all of us around that table. And each one here that accepted this gift and stayed near this man would be loved and forgiven. I don't know how these thoughts tumbled out, but I just knew he loved us. And the only way to stay in that love was to stay near to him. Sadly, I heard later that some around that table did not accept his mercy and love. Over the time that they were near him, they were full of hope, but some drifted away from him after that dinner and became impossible to resist their old life without sticking close to him. But as for me, really, what choice do I have? He had saved my life. That day I encountered my Savior, and I was forever changed. Please say an hour, Father, for me. Et benedictio Dei omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendet super vos et maniet semper. Amen.